So let me begin. In the summer of 2000, I was living in condemned property with my girlfriend, Jill. 4,500 square foot, three-story Victorian in Midtown Baltimore. It had been owned for 10 years by a notorious fraternity who tore it up. The house had sat abandoned for nearly a year because no one would go near it because the bank was selling it as is. And as is meant the three ceilings were falling in, the floors were ruined, the plumbing was shot, but the toilets were full, the roof needed repair, the electricity needed upgrading. All the doors in the house had been used for target practice with darts and knives and hatchets. The boys had taken baseball bats and batted out 72 hand-turned balusters from the staircase. They also took those same bats and also apparently axes and went after the lath and plaster walls. There was graffiti all over the walls. There was garbage in every room. One room had garbage to the ceiling. The back porch, three-story wood porch, was hanging off the back of the house. The backyard was infested with rats. You get the idea. <laughs> Everyone said to me in jail, don't do it. We knew nothing about fixing up old houses, but we loved old houses. And they said, you are going to ruin yourself. You're going to ruin your love. You're going to end up out on the street broke and brokenhearted. And we did it anyway because the house had one time been gorgeous. We loved old houses. We thought this could be a dream house. If we brought this back together, we could realize a dream and clinch our love. <laughs> now, you know, two months into the work, it seemed like they were right. We were at odds every day. The work was killing us, and we were flat broke. And I thought, you know, we need an incentive. We need a boost. So without consulting Jill... I invited my entire family to spend Christmas with us in this house six months away. That's my mother from Arizona, my eldest brother and his wife, and her mother from Florida, my middle brother and his wife from North Carolina, six people. When I told Jill of this invitation, she said, what were you thinking? Are you crazy? We're not going to be ready. We're not going to be anywhere near ready. This will be a disaster. But because we had not even been together for a full year, she didn't know how to talk me out of it. <laughs> there are three things she didn't know. The first one she was starting to learn, which is that I'm overly optimistic. I get ahead of myself. I'm very impulsive. And I make some really bad decisions. <laughs> The second thing was that I felt inferior to my two older brothers. They were straight ahead, solid guys. They made a good living and they took care of my mother and I couldn't do that. And I'd already been on two divorces and I'd, I'd never owned any property. I just wanted to show that, you know, I was coming to my own. I was, I was pulling things together. And the third thing was that I wanted to give my family something for Christmas. I wanted to give them this great holiday and this great old house, kind of like an Andy Williams Christmas special. So I was channeling that and I was just thinking, yes, we're going to do this. Just kind of the way we had Christmases when I was a kid. But six months later, guess what? We're still living in condemned property. We had failed our inspection in September, and I was devastated. I was so devastated that I redoubled my conviction that we had to do Christmas. So two days before Christmas, two days before Christmas, my family is arriving, and what they don't know is that this house is not even up to HUD standards. I mean, we, we, we're talking bear bulbs hanging from the ceilings. We're talking the major stairway is cobbled together with plywood. We're talking the floors are dirty. All I've been doing for six months was plastering. Plaster dust was everywhere. It was impossible to get rid of. Jill had been stripping paint, and paint was peeling, flaking off of all the surfaces, and a lot of the, the house was black and blue, which were the fraternity's favorite colors. And we had just painted over all the graffiti with white primer, but we would not put paint to the walls for real for three years. We had no idea. And I would be plastering for another six months. So... The night before, we stayed up all night, and here's what they were walking into. There was no mantles, no mirrors, no lights, no decorations, no Christmas tree. All our belongings were still in boxes. All our furniture, until that morning, was in a heap in the living room, which we had neighbors to help us put away. And then finally, my mother is the first to arrive. She steps in. The first thing she does is start crying. She says, oh, oh you, you poor things. How can you live this way? And I said, no, Mom, it's going to be great. We're going to have a great time. We put her in a room. Five minutes later, Jill finds my mother with her handkerchief cleaning up the dust. Oh, it's so dirty in here. Ten minutes later, I go in the bedroom, and I find Jill weeping. She says, your mother hates me. I said, that's not true. You know, she had met my mother one time before, and she had done great. But my mother's a southern lady, and she has certain expectations, and Jill just took those on. Then my brothers and their wives and my eldest brother's mother-in-law showed up and I warned my brothers about our basset hound. Our basset hound, Harriet, 14-year-old, and she was a uh, borderline personality. 
And so what would happen is that she would waddle up to you and she'd wag her tail and she'd have big old floppy ears and she'd look up at you with her roomy eyes and she'd say, aren't I just the cutest little hush puppy dog? Don't you just love me? And you'd look down and say, yeah, you are a cute little hush puppy dog. Let me pet you. And you'd reach down to pet her and she would bite you. She bit everybody. She bit Jill every day. Now, she wouldn't break the skin, but she would she'd bite pretty hard. And it was kind of startling when you're coming into the house and the dog's wagging his tail and, and saying, just love me. And my elder brother, you know, I said, you know, don't, don't touch that dog. And he did. And he got bitten. And then my middle brother, I said, no, no, she's, she, you know, she's got issues. And he got bitten. And he said, well, she was wagging her tail. And I said, well, I told you, she's like borderline personality. You got and then my middle brother, who always travels with vodka, broke out the vodka. Then my mother, who always travels with Jim Beam, broke out the Jim Beam. Everybody started drinking. And they're, of course, they're standing around like this because Harriet liked to be close. And so she's circling like a shark. <laughs> now, to give everybody relief, we went down the block to our friend's house. They had this gorgeous Victorian showcase of the house. And my mother takes out her camera. And she starts taking pictures. And Jill overhears my mother say to the other mother-in-law, I'm going to tell my friends back home that this is Jill and Ron's house. <laughs> And Jill, Jill is just heartbroken. And that night, she, she cries herself to sleep. Not that anybody got any sleep because of two other animals. One was Corona, who lived on the third floor, never left the third floor. We called her the mad kitty in the attic. And what she liked to do to people who were sleeping on the third floor was do mountain climbing, climb over you intermittently all night long. <laughs> then we had another cat named Charlie, who was 18 years old, and he was demented. And after dark, he would get sundowner syndrome and think he was lost. And so he'd wander through the house, caterwauling. I'm lost. And the other thing about Charlie was that he was arthritic, so he had this really odd walk when he went up the stairs and down the stairs. It sounded like a peg leg pirate. Boom, boom. So he's peg-legging all around the house, intermittently caterwauling. Nobody got any sleep that night. So I'm the first up in the morning. Dawn and I sense that something's really wrong in the house. It's so incredibly cold. And I run down thinking that the furnace is broken. But I, what I find out is that the, the door has blown open and filled the entire house with freezing air. It was already incredibly cold there to begin with. So I run out and get space heaters and I bring them back. And when I come back, it's 11 o'clock. Christmas Eve morning, everyone's standing around drinking hot whiskey and wearing, uh, and wearing their uh, parkas, and of course standing like this because Harriet's circling everybody. <laughs> so I say, you know, fire up those space heaters, we're going to get this place toasty in no time, it's going to be great, let me go out and get a treat. Now Jill pulls me aside and says, Ron, it's noon on Christmas Eve, nobody's going to have an eight foot tree, which is what we needed for this house. I said, no, 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 there's plenty of time. I went out and she was right. I spent two, I spent two and a half hours looking for what apparently was the only eight-foot Christmas tree left in Baltimore, and I did find it, and I found it because nobody had wanted it, kind of like the house. It, one, one third of the tree was blighted. It was without needles. <laughs> but it was cheap, so I bought it, and I brought it home, and we all pretended to have a good time with that. And then to give the family some more relief, because we were all freezing, and they were getting really drunk, what we did, we took them to another friend's house, and those friends had a great you know, wonderful decorations, and they had the most gorgeous tree. And these friends took a picture of me and Jill with the family in front of this gorgeous tree. <laughs> and to this day, that photograph looms large in my memory because it shows such pain and love. And the pain is mine because I'm this far from a nervous breakdown, and this huge house is just killing me. And, and I never imagined that I would hand to my family this pain for Christmas. And here I have failed them once again. And of course my family does what they did, what they still do, and they show great love and patience, and they were smiling through all of that pain. By the time we put everybody on the plane, two days later, nobody had taken off their parkas. Everybody had drank way too much. And my mother vowed that she would never return to Baltimore because it's too cold. <laughs> now, since that time, you know, I vowed that I would make it up because Jill cried for two days. And I just thought, man, this has got to be a better way. And we have. We got married in the house three years after that. And not long after that, this old house magazine featured our work. And we have had the family back for some great Christmases. Yes, Andy Williams' Christmas is right in our house. And now I'm still overly optimistic. I am still incredibly impulsive. I do get ahead of myself. But now when I make those stupid decisions and Jill says, Ron, what are you thinking? I step back. I recall that photograph of that painful holiday weekend. And I say, you're right. Jill, love of my life. I wasn't thinking.
Ron Tanner sharing his tale at the Stoop Storytelling event, Holly Drama, stories of holiday highs and lows. Ron is the author of From Animal House to Our House, a love story, and he's online at ronaldtanner.com. Our house in the middle of our-